when you put money in the bank, you're not really, they don't really keep it there in the, in the vault. So they lend it out and then they lend it out many times over. So yeah, you are actually lending, you are an unsecured lender to the bank and the FDIC. Yeah. They, they don't have enough funds to, to cover anything. All, all roads lead to uh, gold and silver, I guess. Is, you know what? Doesn't it look like that? I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, and welcome to a very special edition of Coffee with Lynette with my very good friend Mario Aneco on the other side of the pond because there's a lot of things happening in England as well. For the last six years, he's been informing and educating worldwide audience on YouTube and other platforms about our monetary system, the financial markets and precious metals. Ludwig von Mises once said, you get into the inflationary route, eventually people will realize that you won't be able to stop inflating and then they will want to get rid of the currency. And the reality is, I think we've just seen that we are very, very near that. At this stage, it may be difficult to tell you exactly the moment, but quite honestly, it can happen overnight as we saw with SBB Bank. 48 hours, two days, gone. Mario, thank you so much for joining us today. So Mario, thank you so much for joining us today. There is so much to talk to you about. Yes, you're welcome. And uh, thanks for having me. Yes, uh, we scheduled this probably a couple of months ago and uh, we picked a really good uh, day. We sure did. But I'm thinking that the dominoes are starting to fall. You know, if we go back just to last September, because these things don't happen in a one off, it's more like a chain reaction. And last September, you had the Bank of England jump into the market to buy gilts. Do you want to, um, you want to talk about that? Yeah, I, um, noticed since, uh, the beginning of 2022 that bond yields and interest rates uh, were rising mm -hmm. quite a bit and, uh, 10 year yield, uh, in the, the UK, the gilt yield was below 1% in 2021. And then all of a sudden <laughs> going up and, uh, uh, two, three, you know, four and uh, a month before everything kicked off in this uh, LD, LDI, uh, liquidity driven investments, which were used by uh, defined benefit pension uh, mm -hmm. companies. I was warning that something was going to happen because even though yields were relatively low, three or 4%, the fact that they went from below one so quickly uh, to four. I thought was going to cause an accident for the UK gilt market and for the, yeah, for the, for, for the pound as well. We saw the pound drop to 103 versus the dollar. And then to top it all off, it was a time when government was changing here. They had like set up this huge fund to basically bail out every consumer from higher energy uh, prices. They guarantee the cap for utility bills. And then you had this mini budget by uh, Quasi Kartang under uh, Liz Truss's 40, 40 odd day uh, government or premiership. And it really uh, snowballed the, the crisis. Uh, guilt yields went through the roof. I think they went up above 5% in the longer end. And everything unraveled, and the Bank of England had to uh, step in to do not QE. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like this is not a bailout. So, yeah, <laughs> not QE. But can you draw a line from what happened then? Because, because when interest rates go up, I always use my little chopstick. When interest rates go up, the market value of the corresponding debt, so bonds, go down. So, you know, did all of the actions that the Bank of England did, did that fix the problem? Is the problem fixed or is it just more hidden? I don't think it's fixed because the Bank of England doesn't have any, well, we don't have that much gold in the UK anymore, even though the Bank of England right. holds gold for other uh, central banks. 
No, it was just created out of thin air, this uh, bank, uh, central bank money, and the uh, and the markets and investors still have faith and confidence in the Bank of England, even though up until recently, uh, guilt yields were starting to go back up. But now they've come, come off a bit with what's happened uh, in the US with the intervention, the backstop and not bailout. Even guilt yields dropped yesterday. But I, I noticed today that uh, treasury yields are back up, and so are guilt yields. So it's really volatile. I, I tweeted out uh, about half an hour ago that um, the volatility in treasury markets uh, remind me of the Italian government bond. I used to trade the BTP future uh, before Italy joined the euro when we had the Italian lira, and it was uh, it was a wild market to trade because it was so volatile. And uh, that just goes to show how um, the credibility of these uh, markets, these government securities, in my opinion, have uh, gone, gone out the window, especially now that the central banks are supposed to be selling them from their balance sheets. Who's going to buy them? Well, right. And can they even do that? Can they sell them into this market right now? No, because they've just like, bring us whatever you have. It doesn't matter what the current market value is. We'll loan you the money at par. But can you draw a line from what happened last September to, you know, all of these other dominoes that are starting to fall? Yeah, I, I think it's just like, a, I mean, I've never fought in a war. I've watched all the movies. It's like a battlefield with mines. The first yes. mine that... First mine that went off was here in the UK. Second, I guess you could say Japan, there's been a, a mine right. went off there in, in December. And now in the US, uh, this huge uh, banking um, banking trouble is uh, another mine that's gone off. And uh, it, it seems to be every three months, right? Uh, September, uh, September uh, end of September, beginning of October, then December, Japan, March, the US, so what's going to happen in June? I don't know. Uh, something will come out of, uh, you know, left field. Right. Well, it seems to be these unintended consequences. But can do you think, knowing what we know now, can these central banks continue to raise rates to, quote unquote, fight the inflation that they themselves actually, I mean, this whole circumstance I haven't heard really one central banker really step up and say, well, yeah, we forced everybody into these zero interest rate policy, negative rates. That means that they're buying bonds and these securities at the highest possible levels. And now we're raising rates. And, and even the central banks are losing money, which doesn't really matter, right? Doesn't really matter because they can just print more of it. Does it matter? No, not for them. I guess they're uh, they're not like normal uh, private companies. They they'll just uh, sit on the losses. The Fed, I think, is sitting on, on over a trillion dollars of losses, and they've got the very similar balance sheet to Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, but yes. um, yeah, um, what can they do? I mean, it's uh, <laughs> I don't think they the Fed can continue to do a quantitative tightening or i.e. unwind their balance sheet because this new program program they have is basically QE because they're they're, they're saying we're going to buy you know, any securities that you need to sell to us even if they're worth 80 cents to the dollar we're going to pay 100 right uh, that, that's a my by doing QT it, it makes no sense to do BTFP right but even, even with all of the QT that they were doing, we were still inside of a very loose financial system. So what they did by raising these rates, even though we're seeing now, and we, I don't think, do you think that this is the end of it or do you think that there's more to come? In terms of the uh, banking crisis? Yes. Oh, I don't think it's the end. I, I think uh, the, I saw someone tweet, I think it was Gold Telegraph, on Twitter, apparently the median uh, deposit in the U.S. bank deposit is just over five thousand dollars. So, SVB was mainly like a a bank for the very venture. wealthy mm -hmm. venture capital. They they had mm -hmm. 
97% of deposits were over 250,000. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the, <laughs> I think the very, the very wealthy in corporations, they're going to say to themselves, we can't have millions in one bank. Uh, they're going to try to spread it around, even if they spread it around or put it with JP Morgan or one of the GSIBs, they call them, the uh, systemically... Uh, Globally and systemically important banks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, they. who's to say that it would be okay with JP Morgan? Uh, and uh, can the FD, The FDIC only has, I think, $125 billion, uh, mm -hmm. in assets. So I think right. there is... A, yeah. But all deposits, 100% of all deposits are now backstopped. Who are they really trying to save? Yeah, and, and I think how how much is there in deposits? Seventeen trillion or something? How can one hundred twenty five billion really do anything? And uh, I, I think uh, the mainstream media, even though I don't watch the mainstream media, the business news, I just spoke to someone saying, and they said, well, they're trying to really patch it up. You know, they're saying everything's fine. And I listened yesterday uh, to uh, U.S. Uh, House of Representative. A uh, guy called, uh, I forgot, his, let's see, Jeff Jackson. He's from North Carolina and he was on TikTok. And uh, he said, Oh, it's 2 a.m. I've just come from this Zoom meeting with the U.S. Treasury. All the members of Congress are there. And he said, Everything's fine. Don't worry. The FDIC has covered everything, <laughs> they, they've covered all the deposits. Uh, there is no problem. And I looked at his uh, details, and he's a Democrat from North Carolina, and he had 2.9 million views. So they're really trying hard to oh, yeah. tell look, that everything's fine. But I think the people with the billions and or hundreds of million, uh, I don't think uh, maybe this was a wake up call to them. Uh, to, they realized that um, yeah, there is no money in the banks. It's all it's all credit, like J P Morgan would have said. There's none of this anymore, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> there's none of this, but there's a whole lot of debt and a whole That's lot of right. currencies that just yeah. do not exist anymore. And I noticed that uh, one of the guys who started taking uh, his money out from SVB. Uh, one of the first people was Peter Thiel of Palantir, the guy who also co-founded PayPal. Uh, last year, Palantir announced that they bought $50 million worth of physical gold. So, you know, Jeff, Peter, that's Peter, his vote. Yeah, Peter Thiel and these people know. know. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think, uh, yeah, I don't think it's, over by any stretch of the you know any stretch of the imagination maybe there there's might be another uh mine <laughs> that will explode in another part of the world but uh, this has done a lot of damage and uh it's not over yet yeah i i think the biggest you know you brought it up it's that credibility piece it's that confidence piece and you know the markets I mean, we've been watching that confidence piece and that credibility piece erode over time, you know, and everything people need to understand that everything kind of seems to happen slowly until it happens fast. And so the time to get in position is when, I mean, have we bought ourselves a little bit of a reprieve in here? Maybe. It looks like it. And uh, I've spoken to people and I said, if I was one of these uh, venture capitalists or had billings in the bank, I would be running to uh, not transfer it to JP Morgan, but maybe get some physical gold and silver. But then again, yeah. <laughs> a lot of these people think uh, a lot of people think gold and silver are uh, risky, even though they've had Isn't that uh, they've crazy? Been a value for thousands of years. Yeah, and they're used in every sector of the global economy. So that means it has the broadest base of functionality, the broadest base of demand, but the paper contracts are really risky. Sure, because they're not real. And you can't really even collect on them. With this, you hold it, you own it, you've got some, I've got some, smart money has a lot. Look at what the central banks have been doing. Look at what Peter's been doing. 
that should be a wake up call when the smartest guys in the room on any given topic are getting into position for themselves. So it, I think it should be more of a wake up call to the public, to the general public, that your wealth is not safe in that system. Definitely not. And I think what's going to happen, though, is a lot of people don't have 250000 or more in the bank. So they're just going to leave it there or keep, keep it in uh, Federal Reserve uh, currency, which is fiat. And it's going to keep getting diluted because it's impossible for the dollar to, to do well when the government and the Fed 100% guarantee $17 trillion. I mean, it, it's getting like Zimbabwe and Venezuela like, I would say. Oh, that is a really, really good point. And, and so what, what does that mean to the public? It means, you know, you can hold it in the banking system, but it doesn't matter how many, we get blinded by numbers. It doesn't matter how many numbers you have. It matters what you can convert it into, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, the purchasing power of the dollar is going to keep dropping. And also of uh, our currency here in the UK, uh, also the euro and all other currencies, the Canadian dollar, Australian. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the Australian dollar is making all-time highs uh, versus gold. Uh, it did recently. So it, it's going to happen everywhere, even in China, I would say. Well, there are 100, uh, reportedly, 190... Uh, companies or banks that have been impact, no companies that have been impacted by what happened with SVB all over the world. And there are lots of calls of action on your neck of the woods over in Great Britain. So can you explain more about, you know, how and why and what you think about that? Yeah, I think uh, 200 of these fintechs, uh, venture capital, small tech companies or startups, they sent a letter and all their CEOs or chiefs signed it to the chancellor, I think, over the weekend. Mm -hmm. Because for some reason, they all banked with SVB, SVB UK, and that's going on there as well. And uh, they, well, they bailed them out, even though they're calling it they're not calling it a bailout. Right. So what they, the government did and the Bank of England, they met with HSBC and SVB UK, and they engineered a, a purchase of SVB UK, not SVB, the whole bank, but just the UK arm mm -hmm. uh, by HSBC for one pound. <laughs> so, and I, I heard rumors, this is just rumors that HSBC was very exposed to SVB UK, but I, I think it's outrageous that we have to basically bail out the taxpayers to bail out uh, venture capital firms that probably, exactly. uh, I, I would say 90, 90, 95% of them won't succeed anyway, but we have this mentality, not just here, but everywhere in the West that governments have to help business and uh, here they think that we are like the center of fintech and we can't let these uh, firms fail. And the other thing I would add is a lot of these firms are involved in payment system, yes. uh, even blockchain. So they, they, they were, they're probably going to be heavily involved in the Bank of England digital currency because the Bank of England is saying that the CBDC wallet it's not going to be provided by the Bank of England, but by third parties. So can you imagine if they had let all these uh, 200 companies collapse? That would have uh, delayed, I, I think, their plans for a digital currency, probably by a few years. That is a phenomenal insight. I mean, and I hope everybody gets that, that by not bailing them out, by allowing these companies to fail, when they, and there is, it's private public partnership with these CBDCs around the world, right? So if they let those companies fail, then that really puts a damper on their plans to bring out a CBDC. Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, I hadn't um, thought about that, but uh, someone tweeted out a couple of days ago, the list of all the companies that uh, begged <laughs> the chancellor of the exchequer for a bailout. And I went through 
not all of them, but some of them. And a lot of them were in the payments and fintech, uh, like a uh, blockchain. Yeah. And I thought to myself, well, they're not going to let, let them fail because they're going to be working with the Bank of England. And, and I think in the US, it's uh, the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, the value, you know, Silicon Valley, <laughs> they're yeah. all involved with the cryptos, even though they've uh, left, let this bank collapse. It's just going to, I think the big banks are just going to have more, more control of them. Like HSBC is a big bank and uh, I'm sure, I'm not sure who's going to take over the, uh, the business from SVB in the US, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's one of the big uh, Wall Street banks like uh, maybe JP Morgan. Uh, I think that's a good point. And isn't this about the anniversary of Bear Stearns when JP Morgan took over Bear? I think, I think yeah, I think it was sometime in March 2008, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. So I, I don't know. It's kind of interesting, the timing of all of this. But you also bring up a great point, and that is that whenever there is a crisis, there is also a banking consolidation. And so, and that's what's happening right now. A lot of people are moving their those that are paying attention anyway, are moving their funds out of the mid-range banks and the small banks into the big banks. But then there are the takeovers like you just indicated with HSBC taking over for SVB England or the UK for a pound. And that means yeah. that that is, isn't that danger then more concentrated well, yeah, I mean, in the UK, we don't, I mean, in the US, there's over 4,000 banks, according to the FDIC. So it's still uh, quite, you know, not so centralized, even though the the big Wall Street banks and like the other GSIB banks are, are, are huge. But here in the UK, we only have four or five big banks. So we've already been uh, centralized big time. I, I think the country that needs it more not that it's a good thing, but in the perspective of the globalists is the U.S. They'd want to see the U.S. banking system probably just be a few big banks. It's in, easier to in control. Each, uh, each Fed uh, district. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's easier to control. It's and and there has been major consolidation, particularly since two thousand, where you know they keep changing the regulations, and now this whole thing is being blamed on the Trump era deregulations of Dodd-Frank, which enabled, you know, more leverage, less oversight, and fewer investor protections. But quite honestly, when they wrote that, they hadn't written in all the laws. And by the time they basically completely dismantle it, except for the bail-in, there were still so many laws that had to be written, let alone not just written, but actually executed that over, all, over this last, what, decade and a half or something like that, you know, I, I've really frankly thought that that was just a joke. Yeah, I think you, if you're going to look at the what Trump did, you need to look at what Bill Clinton did. Thank you. With Repealing Glass-Steagall and allowing commercial banks to be involved in derivatives. I, I think that was the biggest mistake, of course. 100%. And, and, I, and there was uh, just one person that she was the head of the CFTC at the time. I forgot Brooks her name. Brooksley. Uh, Brooksley Bourne. Yes, Brooksley Bourne. Yeah. She, she tried to warn about that in Congress. And then Greenspan and Larry Summers, who we know is still around and is a good friend of we, <laughs> that guy who, uh, you know, not want to mention names here, but yeah, they like uh, attacked her, you know, they went after her and said, no, what are you talking about? Right. And, and also Robert Rubin, he was involved yes. in it. Yes, Citibank. Was, yeah, he was the secretary of the treasury under Clinton and then Summers took over. And, but Rubin used to be the CEO of Goldman Sachs. And then when he, when they got the Glass-Steagall through, the bank that benefited the most was Citibank, and they, they gave him a position and paid him like over $100 million just for sitting in an office. And then when Citibank collapsed in 08, they made sure that he got paid. I mean, uh, 
I would look more at that than I'm not too familiar with what uh, deregulations Trump made. But now uh, Biden came out, oh, we have to regulate the banks more right. carefully, better. But uh, this BTFP is like goes totally against the uh, truthfulness uh, of the, you know, of the banking systems, basically telling that uh, those FDIC reported losses that the banks have, you don't have to worry about them anymore. That would make it less transparent for uh, people who put money in the bank. They don't, they have no idea if the bank is safe. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And since you brought up derivatives and, and that's a hundred percent correct when you let uh, the lifting of the Glass-Steagall Act allowed risk-taking investment banks to merge and become one with deposit-taking banks. And, and then in 95, what they do, they allowed, they created the sweep accounts. So you make a deposit, those deposits are swept into a sub-account that's in the bank's name, and then they can use that. Number one, they have to hold back fewer reserves, and that's also what happened in uh, with uh, the Trump with the Trump change, uh, so fewer re and we've seen and not just with that. I mean, we've seen those changes over time, so that the banks have more that they can gamble with. But the problems ninety eight long term capital management was a derivative explosion, and then in two thousand and seven two thousand and eight that was also a derivative explosion. Are we sitting on top of another derivative explosion, do you think? Well, LDI and the guilt uh, meltdown was a derivative explo explosion. But oh, a bigger yeah, that, one? Yeah, of course. Uh, I think derivatives are still a, a problem. Uh, they, the BIS only values them at 600 trillion, but it's probably over a quadrillion because they changed the accounting uh, yeah. method. Um, they they always like to change these rules to make it just like you said, uh, they have to keep very few reserves. I think it was in 2020 that the Fed uh, has allowed banks to have zero reserves. That's which is right. Crazy. And I mean, no one probably is talking about that on the uh, business channels, and I don't watch them that much. I only see a few clips on Twitter, but no. <laughs> I think the Chinese, uh, they have a reserve requirement ratio of just about 7.8%. I mean, uh, you, U.S. is zero. <laughs> I think in the U.K. it's 2%, but I looked into that. Back in the 70s in the U.K., it used to be 12%. Interesting. I mean, so people don't realize how vulnerable they are at any amount that they put in there. And how many times you hear, oh, well, don't worry about it because it's insured. Right. Well, the, it, it, all of it is based upon the claims paying ability of the counterparty, period. Yeah, and, and I think now with this promise to guarantee all, all accounts, I think that might calm people down for them to leave their uh, money in the bank. But I think the smart money they don't buy it. No. <laughs> yeah. And the people who don't have, you know, 250,000, they'll just keep it there because it's it's in short ends, but they're going to lose, as I said, the purchasing power. Even if they don't lose the actual dollars, I mean, you know, it just, the purchasing power, and you can see it on the FRED, F-R-E-D, for those that are watching, purchasing power of the consumer dollar, it just keeps going down 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 and that's official so yeah and uh yeah sorry no no go ahead no and i remember a few years ago alan greenspan was uh on tv with i think austin goldsby i think he's he's been like uh talked about becoming like a fed uh president or governor but Greenspan said on TV, oh, the, the U.S. government the, we, or the Fed, we can just print whatever we want. We can hand the uh, this guy, Austin right. Mosby. He looked at him like this, you know, you know, what are you talking? You know, don't say that in front of everyone. But that's the truth. Yeah, the, the U.S. Treasury won't go bankrupt, but um, the, the piece of paper won't be worth much, the promise. 
It's a fact. And we and we in, here in the U.S., we just got another CPI reading, which for for whatever that's worth, because I don't trust any of these numbers, but it's proving to be stickier than they anticipated. Oh, my goodness. So now I think that's happening globally, too, where how are these central banks now going to fight the inflation that they caused and deal with the instability in the global banking system. Because what everybody should have seen is that this impacts everybody around the world, not just, it's not just SVB Bank. Yeah, and in the last few months, or maybe even six months, I've seen uh, economists from Wall Street and like, you know, the Keynesian types uh, saying we need to lift the CPI, they call it inflation target from two to, to three or four, because if we raise rates too much, it's going to cause an accident. And uh, I don't know if you heard of Chris, Chris Whalen. I think he worked for the New York Fed, but he's like a, a respected bank analyst. And uh, over the weekend, he was being interviewed by blockchain uh, macro, blockworks ma macro, quite a good YouTube channel. And he said, uh, well, we got to forget about inflation now because if we keep trying to contain inflation, everything's going to collapse. So that's not me saying it. That's a guy who worked for the New York Fed, New York Fed, and is uh, he's not a believer, of course, in sound money. But right. uh, so so what's the implication of that, in your opinion? Well, the implication is that you got to uh, hold on to your gold and silver's much as you can, you know, as hard as you can, because it's hard to, it's not easy because sometimes you have emergencies and try to keep stacking. Be, uh, and because uh, it, there could be also a, a, a trigger of faith and confidence. It could be overnight. Right. Like yes. People, the people with a lot of money, they could just go to JP Morgan and say, I want my, I want gold. I want to take my, you know, money out because I don't trust things anymore. It, it could happen because um, right now it, it's calmed down, but uh, I'm not too sure they're going to succeed, especially when you see politicians now coming out. Oh, don't worry. The banking system is sound and there's loads of liquidity. When you listen, hear people say that, then you have to be worried about it. Yeah, exactly. And whatever they title anything, it's really just the opposite. Consumer protection. Oh, no. It's a whole lot. And, and over this last, what, 14, 15 years, the consumer protections and everything in contracts and these debt contracts, as well as the reserve, they've gone down substantially. So would you say that this could potentially be, if not, is the lead up to the hyperinflation and that that's coming a lot sooner than maybe a lot yeah. of people anticipate? Definitely. Uh, this is huge. I think uh, even though a lot of people will say, well, you've been saying that for a few years, but uh, I think it was um, Hemingway who said, you know, how, how did, did you go broke? And he said gradually. And then uh, and then it happened all of a sudden. So exactly. I mean, God, SVB Bank, didn't they or weren't they up for and did they win like March 1st, like the best bank? Or something. It was some kind of fancy title yeah. like that. I saw that. Yeah, it's it's crazy. And they were paying. Well, I, I think the the bonuses they paid the day before. I mean, the morning or afternoon before they went bust. That was nefarious because I think they knew they're gonna go bust and they gave themselves bonuses. But yeah, I saw something that they they were being considered for a prize a couple of weeks or a week before they. Uh, they collapsed. So exactly. uh, it's just a very uh, fickle system based on, uh, as John Exter said, I owe you nothings. Really? Yeah. Yeah. The guy who talked about the inverted pyramid and he worked for the New York banks. He worked for the, the Fed. He ha helped found the uh, Ceylon or Sri Lankan Central Bank. I mean... <laughs> He, he's after 1971 he said, well, the dollar is now, I owe you nothings. Yeah, very good point. And he's got that inverted uh, 
pyramid. And what's mm. on the bottom, the most sound money is, yep. Yeah. That's it. That's it. So Well, I, the Fed's balance sheet, uh, when you go back to its beginning, was mostly gold and uh, three-month discount uh, bills for real goods. I think uh, they had very. They didn't have much government bonds. Uh, they were not supposed to have government bonds in right. their balance sheet. And uh, we see now that treasuries are not safe. Right. The only, the only thing that's safe is really gold and silver um, on, on your balance sheet. And maybe the discount bills because uh, they're uh, bills for real, real goods. Uh, yeah. Well, let's talk about the treasury bond safety for a second. And because that underpins the entire global financial system, but we've been watching the liquidity in that area drop and drop and drop till we had that one uh, mismatch in 2015 was, was the, the first one that really reared its ugly head. And, and according to the TYVIX, which is no longer published, but so that's the treasury volatility index, when you look at it, you can see where the traders took over that arena. So can you talk a little bit to the liquidity and the implications for that underpinning the global system? Yeah, you spoke about 2015 and, and then in 2020 as well, there was mm -hmm. a lot of volatility and problems mm -hmm. in the credit market. And I saw one of the uh, Fed presidents recently said that, uh, the treasury market is uh, shaky and, and again mentioned the liquidity problem and it's been mentioned for the last few years and basically i remember i started out uh when i started out i did uh treasury uh cash trading and uh the bid and offers are very tight and there's a lot of like like let's say you could buy a two year for par and two 30 seconds was the bid and two and one eighth of a 30 second was the offer. And there's 50 million on each side. So very liquid, but if, nowadays uh, the bid and offer spread is widening and there's less liquidity. And the, the, and I think the major reason why this is happening is because the uh, yeah, the debt's grown so much <laughs> and uh, the central banks are a big part of the uh, owners. So there's no real organic uh, demand for treasuries anymore because who'd want to own something that there's so much of it out there. And, and I think that that's a, a big problem as well, the liquidity. And when you see like uh, what's happened in the last two days, the volatility where yields yesterday dropped like 40 to 20 basis points and today they've gone up right. again. Uh, yeah, the the market makers in in the banks and the brokers they they're gonna make a, a much wider bid and offer. It's like in uh, gold, you know, the the bullion dealers. If the market is volatile, they're gonna take a bigger premium because they they're gonna try to hedge their exposure. And it's the same thing for treasuries. Um, and it's supposed to be what underpins, like you said, the whole world's financial system. How safe does that make you feel? <laughs> not, not too safe. <laughs> that's why you own this. Yeah, that's and right. This, because it's not all, safe. You know, all, all roads lead to uh, gold and silver, I guess. Is You know what? Doesn't it look like that? Because this is not the time to speculate, right? And the Fed does not have yours or my back. And... Okay, this, this statement, and then we're kind of running out of time, but the statement that we're going to backstop everybody, we're going to pay all these uninsured deposits, but that's not taxpayer money because it's supposedly coming out of the diff fund, which as you said earlier, it's actually like $128 billion uh, to underpin that, what, $17, 18000000000000 trillion in there. I mean... How is it that it's not that the taxpayer is not the one that's going to end up paying for this puppy? Yeah, aside from the the FDIC 125 billion, the Fed is just going to load up its balance sheet, take all those losses, and that yeah, and that makes the currency worth less. 
So it's a hidden tax of inflation. It's a hidden tax of inflation. And ultimately, taxpayers, and they do say this, are responsible for the Fed's balance sheet, as we are for the government balance sheet. So personally, I think it's garbage when they say that the taxpayer isn't going to pay for this. So don't call it a bailout. Just like don't call it QE because it's a little, it's a little different. Yeah, it's not really any different. Well, it's a backstop, according to them. <laughs> yeah, it's a, well, who's got their backstop? Who's we backing stop? Exactly. So is there anything else that you want to bring up that you feel people need to be aware of? Yeah, that when you put money in the bank, you're not really, they don't really keep it there in the in the vault. So they lend it out and then they lend it out many times over. So yeah, you're actually lending. You are an unsecured lender to the bank. And the FDIC, yeah, they, they don't have enough funds to, to cover anything. That, that's all I can say. And uh, yeah, have a little bit of gold and silver on the side, even if you uh, don't believe in it. But uh, just as a precaution, it, right. it's like insurance. Insurance. You, you're not going to buy uh, insurance for, uh, you know, fire insurance for your house after the house burns down. You buy it before. Really good. And I think we're close, we're close to burning down. The system's close to burning down, I think. Yeah. And and maybe we've postponed it for a minute. Time is going to tell us that. Or maybe we haven't. Maybe the next shoe is getting ready to fall and we just can't see it yet. So would you call what just happened a black swan event? Yeah. Black swans are flying. Had you heard? I'd never heard of SVB Bank before. Nope. Nope. But it sure has huge tentacles, huge tentacles on a global basis. Well, Mario, thank you so much. This has been a really important conversation and I really appreciate your perspective and all of the links, but how can they find you? Well, I'm on YouTube at Maneco64. I'm also on, on Twitter quite regularly at Maneco 19, 1964. There are a few people impersonating that uh, handle. But uh, yeah, mostly YouTube. I make a, a video uh, every day, really, uh, about what's going on and about the markets. Well, you're definitely someone to listen to. You know, I retweet your work a lot every time I see it. And it's good because it's always good. I retweet it. So thank you so much for being here today. And I certainly hope that our viewers got as much out of this conversation. I mean, this is a really important conversation. Take heed. And until next we meet, remember, financial shields are made of physical gold and physical silver, not paper and promises. Perfect. Here, we'll do it together. We'll do it together. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Great. And until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.